one. Hello, I'm Sam Fry. I'm here to ask you a question. If you were to stand before God today and he asked you, what relationship do we share that I would want to hang out for you with you forever in my heaven, what would you tell him? I'm here to tell you the answer. The only answer that will work if he were to stand before you and ask you this today. Ultimately, he won't have to ask the question. He knows our hearts. God's word says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And what does he see when in uh, when he looks at our heart, when he views that, uh, what answer will work to get us into his presence? Not just uh, for the moment, but for all eternity. Well, this is the answer to that. Uh, it goes something like this. I'm here today to share with you the good news about how you can know this. I want to introduce you to two people today. Two people. First person you know very well. You take care of this person. You want them to have a lot of uh, money in their bank account. You want them to have fabulous vacations. You really mean for them to pay their mortgage ahead of time. You want their family to adore them. You, it's really your intention of your heart that the people that, that with whom they work respect them as they come in and out of the office. And if you haven't guessed it already, this person's a very close person to you. In fact, this person is you. I want to talk to you about you. And I'll just take this red paint. I've got to make some yellow letters out of it. But I want to talk to you today about you. Not just you though, you and I, some things that we all have in common. One thing we have in common is that there's somebody else that knows us better than we know ourselves. He cares more than we could even possibly care about the sufferings, the pains, the challenges that we face in this life. And uh, he cares very much for us. He loves us more than we can even love ourselves. And he has infinitely more control over our lives uh, than we do. If you haven't guessed it already, I'll write that up here. And this is a person who I want to talk to you about. And I did say a person. I didn't say some cosmic force, some gooey thing out there, uh, some intelligence. No, he's a real person. And as with the uh, case of any personality, he needs to be related to on a personal basis. Uh, you can anger him. You can please him and so on. Uh, but there is a God in heaven. We place God, you know, the, the word God in in the sky here in our illustration, but we know by definition that God lives everywhere. You can't go anywhere and not have God waiting there for you when, when you get there. Uh, he's all present. He's all, uh, he's all present. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. And as he knows everything, he knows that there's a barrier. There's a barrier that stands between him and ourselves. Above all else, God is one thing. He's holy. In other words, everything fitting, everything proper, everything powerful, beautiful, anything you want to put in the blank, God is that times infinity. In one word, God is holy. It's the same word from which we get saint and, uh, sanct and uh, uh, sanctified, things like this. It's the idea of being set apart from all of his creation. He's not just beautiful. He's beautiful in a play way that transcends all of his creation. He's not just powerful. He's powerful uh, beyond what we could even reason. Uh, he's omni, everything good. He's holy. You and I, not so much. Only things and people that God touch get to be holy. There's no holiness innate, innately within us. Why? Because of this barrier that stands between God and ourselves. I know you uh, believe in this barrier. It's why we lock our doors at night. It's why we live in fear of one another. It's why we don't have enough police in most areas. It's a problem of this word right here. Problem of sin. S-I-N. The middle letter really defines the word. I want to do what I want to do, regardless of what God's word says about it. We all live that way each day of our lives. And we are seen in our sinfulness by this holy God. In Isaiah 6, uh, verse 3, uh, we see the throne room of God. And all around the throne, everyone's saying, holy, 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 uh, all the time. And that's God's attribute by which he is known that separates him from all his creation. You and I, we're all sinners. God's word tells us all have sinned. Not some or most of us, all of us have sinned. In other words, we miss the mark. Literally, sin means to miss that bullseye. We don't make it to the standard that God intends. Indeed, what he demands of us because of the things that we do, the things that we say, even the thoughts that we embrace that are counter to the character of the God who created us, these things separate us from God. That's why God told his people Israel, and it's true of all of us, as Gentiles as well. All mankind were in the same boat. It's sinking in sin. God said, my ear is not deaf to your cry. 
Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. My arm is not short that it cannot save you, but your sin separates between you and your God. How are we going to break that barrier? Well, there's nothing that we could possibly do to render us deserving of being in the presence of God forever and ever. You know, if you had a, a, your favorite beverage and I just put one drop of poison in it, that's too much. Any poison would be too much. If I put half a glass uh, of poison in it, it'd still be way too much. Any is too much. So it is with God and His righteousness. Anything short of perfection is rendered imperfection. And we're disobedient servants of God if we do even one thing wrong. And we all do, of course, more than that each day. But we're not sin. We're we're sinners uh, because we sin. Uh, I'm sorry. We're not sinners because we sin. We are. We're sinners because we sin. We're not sinning because we're sinners. Uh, in other words, it's our nature to do what's wrong, to do our thing instead of God's thing. It's called iniquity or rebellion that we have in our heart. And we shake our fist by our actions and our attitudes against the God who loves us, who created us, who gives us our every breath, even as we rail against Him. And yet, even while we're yet sinners, God's Word tells us, Christ died for us. You see, when we could not break through that barrier of sin, God loved us anyway, in spite of ourselves. He hates the things that we do that are wrong, but He loves us. And so, in His holiness, in His justice, God must snuff out sin everywhere He sees it. But in His love, He took that punishment on Himself. Jesus Christ, God in human form, suffered and died on that cross. He hung on that cross, separate from God the Father, so that you and I don't have to be. And He didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. He's not dead in the grave. Yes, they put that body that was crucified in that grave, but He rose in that same body went back to heaven, as he said, to prepare a place for all those who would trust in him. He turned back as he rose, uh, ascended into the sky, and he told his followers, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you might be also. In today's verbiage, he said, I'm not going to lie. He said, if it were not so, I would not have told you. And so Jesus is alive. He is a very personification of the way, the truth, and the life, as he said in John chapter 14, verse 6. And uh, so he's not going to lie. Uh, he's walking truth. And we can take God at his word. We have his word on it in his word, the Bible. The Bible says the wages, that is the paycheck, getting what we earn, what we have coming for our shortcomings, for our sin, is death. Death is not an end. Death is a separation. When you die physically, your soul, the real you, is separated from your body. You die spiritually, you're separated not just from your body, but from the presence of God forever and ever. But we never have to uh, deal with that separation from God. We can know Him better and better in this life and for eternity after we leave this planet. How? Simply put, and it is simple, because I was only five years old when I made this de decision, this commitment in my heart to trust Jesus with my destiny. Knowing that I was not worthy of being in the presence of a, a blazingly holy, perfect God, I understood that I could trust Him though. I just trusted this message that Jesus had my name on His mind just like He has yours on His mind as He hung there on the cross. And He died in my place for my sins. Uh, I deserve to be separated from Him forever in a real place called the lake of fire. But even while we're yet sinners, as I said, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death. That's very bad news. But the bad news makes the good news look that much better. The good news is this. While the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As with the nature of any gift, we cannot earn it. We can't work for it. It ceases to be a gift the moment we try. Uh, but we can take it unconditionally and undeservedly uh, as we are. We can still take that to ourselves. We can accept it. And faith alone in Jesus alone as our Savior, as the one who took our place, who suffered and died, gave his perfect life as a sacrifice in our place for our shortcomings and rose again. The moment we believe that message, that he did that for us, and we're willing to humble ourselves in our heart, the best we know how, we say, yes, God, I am undeserving of being in your presence. But sinner that I am, I ask your forgiveness for that sin, knowing that on the basis and authority of your word, the Bible, I have that forgiveness. 
And the Bible does say that he that believes has a son, capital S, that's Jesus. You have the Son of God, Jesus, in your life. You have life. He has not the Son of God, will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We're under a constant storm cloud of God's anger and wrath uh, day to day until the moment where we just say yes to him. Thank you for that free gift. Undeserving though I am, I accept that free gift of knowing you better and better in this life and forever when I die. Today you can make that decision. I hope you are. God's word says we're either for him or against him. There's no neutral turf. Today, if you're not saying yes to Jesus, you're automatically saying no. God's word says now is the day of salvation. We don't know how long we have. God does. And be wise and let God work in your heart. If he's speaking to you now, if you feel in your heart, yes, I need to make this right, it's because of a reason. None of us know how long we have. God has our days numbered and he knows what the number that he'll give us. We need to use this life and the next for him. Uh, how do we do that? We have to come to him. Once we come to him, he, the Bible promises, if any man be in Christ, he'll be a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. And we can look forward and have hope that this world does not have to give these days, but we can have a sure hope and a confidence in whatever happens day to day that God has gone before us, he's got our back in this life, he'll take care of us forever. I hope you make that decision today if you haven't already. And uh, once you come to Jesus, he gives you everlasting life. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him, no matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done, he will forgive it. If you're sincerely from your heart asking his forgiveness and trusting his shed blood, his life on that cross to save you from your sin, but understanding that he gave his life for yours. Uh, whoever believes in him will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. What is life eternal? John 17, verse 3. Life eternal is this, to know God the Father, to know the Son whom he has sent. I hope you know Jesus today. Don't be caught dead without him. Have a great day.